So welcome, my name is Paul Trebilco. It's great to welcome you on behalf of the Department of Theology and Religion. It's a great privilege to welcome Professor Stan Porter tonight uh, and his wife, Wendy. Uh, Stan is President, Dean and Professor of New Testament at McMaster Divinity College in Hamilton, Ontario in Canada. Stan completed his PhD at the University of Sheffield in 1988. From 1994, uh, he was Professor of Theology and Head of the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at Roehampton University in London. Uh, he then moved to McMaster Divinity, where, as I say, he is President and Dean. If you do a search on our university library catalogue, Understand Porter and Books, you come up with 102 books. Stan has authored uh, 28 books himself, uh, has edited over 90 volumes, so we haven't quite got them all here in the, in the library, and he's written over 300 journal articles and book chapters. He is known in the discipline as a prolific and outstanding author. Uh, his many books include some of the following. Idioms of the Greek New Testament, Verbal Aspect in the Greek of the New Testament with reference to tense and mood, Linguistic Analysis of the Greek New Testament Studies in Tools, Methods, and Practice. Fundamentals of New Testament Greek. The Paul of Acts, Essays in Literary Criticism, Rhetoric, and Theology. John, His Gospel, and Jesus in Pursuit of the Johannine Voice. The Criteria for Authenticity in Historical Jesus Research, Previous Discussions, and New Proposals. How did we get our New Testament? text, transmissions, translation. The letter to the Romans, a linguistic and literary commentary. The Apostle Paul, his life, thought, and letters. I won't keep going in the other 90 books. So it's a great privilege to welcome Stan tonight uh, to look forward to his lecture on metaphor in the New Testament, expressing the inexpressible through language. Please join me in welcoming Professor Porter. Thank you very much. Is, can you hear me? Is everybody hear me? Those especially in the back? Very good. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the introduction by Paul. It's always uh, a little embarrassing to hear people talk about oneself. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to be here uh, with you and to be able to talk about uh, the subject. I hope you got the outline. Uh, if you don't, um, there are plenty of them here, and I'll follow the outline and probably skip or at least abbreviate section two so we can get to what I think is probably the most in interesting part, and that is when we get into, into section, uh, section three. But uh, I gave uh, Paul a, a choice of a number of different potential paper topics uh, for, for this evening, and uh, this is the one he chose. And so, which is not my way of saying, if you don't like it, blame Paul for it, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a topic that I've worked on uh, through the years and continue to work on. I find it very interesting as a topic, and I hope that, that you will as well. So by way of introduction, let me say that uh, I'll start with the statement that all language is metaphorical. And I realize that's a controversial statement. It's one that I'm not going to necessarily debate here except to note that explicit recognition of the metaphorical nature of, the, uh, of language has been lacking in a lot of New Testament studies over the last approximately 100 years. Over this period, New Testament studies has emphasized what I consider to be a rather flat world view of language. And of course, I'm using a metaphor there even to describe that. By that, I mean that much New Testament studies has been shackled by a limiting and a constraining literalism, or at least what purports to be a literalism, that wishes to equate words with things and to give such words status as if they were things. And this has resulted in an emphasis upon what I sometimes call the thingness of the ancient world and its texts, rather than on the, the howness. That is, how language is used to reflect upon and even create the world in which the ancients existed. Even some of the most enduring movements within the field of New Testament studies, and one could think, for example, of the biblical theology movement, whether the original form of that or its recent reinvigoration, these have been slow to grasp the importance of metaphor, even though such recognition would appear to have great potential 
for opening up its conceptual and theological horizons. The result of such a narrow view of human experience and use of language is the failure to appreciate the nature and complexity of language itself. We see the evidence of this at its most fundamental level in the continuing utilization of models of language as if they represent the way that language and the world are, rather than recognizing that these models of language are themselves metaphorical approximations of language form and function. We now are living in what I consider to be a relatively unimaginative time in New Testament studies, because we fail to take the linguistic nature of New Testament research into account and with it to appreciate the role and function of metaphor. Fundamental to interpretation is recognition of the role that language plays in human experience. And from that grow all of the other helpful means by which we analyze texts, especially those from the ancient world whose representation is mediated only through epigraphia. From the comments I've just made, one might well expect me to undertake a re-examination of the entire field of New Testament studies. And in many ways, this might well be a desideratum. I believe that many of the areas of New Testament studies merit reassessment as they continue to function within outmoded paradigms that hinder rather than foster further constructive research. However, my ambition here in this paper is a little more narrow than that. I wish to confine myself to one major topic, and that is the use of metaphor in the New Testament and its relationship to systemic functional linguistics. I'll examine theories of metaphor briefly, that's the part two that will be brief, I hope, to see what they help us to understand about language, and then I'm going to treat metaphor from an SFL perspective as it functions within the New Testament. So, theories of metaphor and what they contribute to our understanding. One of the major surprises regarding the lack of attention to metaphor in New Testament studies is that major theories of metaphor go back to the ancients themselves and their influence has been enduring, even if they're probably too narrow and constrained in their definitions. And uh, if I had more time, and I'm gonna keep an eye on my time so that we do have time for questions, um, I would like to say more about you know, how rhetoric function, I mean, how metaphor function within classical rhetoric. You can go back to some of the, the early writers on this with their sort of word-based approach, viewing metaphor as, to a large extent, decorative, and then later on even as, as ornamental, and that no doubt has had an influence on how we view metaphor. But the 20th century really saw the greatest development in theories about metaphor, and especially in three areas, philosophical, literary, and linguistic. And some of the philosophical theories on metaphor, there are two in, in that area, there are really two major figures. One is Max Black, and the other is Paul Ricoeur. And uh, Max Black refers, basically has more of the analytical tradition in mind, and Ricoeur would reflect more continental philosophy. Um, and they have some, some interesting differences between the two, although um, they both end up with what is sometimes called a tensive view of metaphor. And I think Ricoeur hits on something very, very interesting because he has kind of this larger level view that appeals to discourse, but fundamentally, it kind of boils down to the idea of if you use the copulative verb be, you have this notion of both similarity and difference sort of built into it by definition. That is a kind of a productive idea that we'll, that we'll allude to a little bit later. In the literary field, I.A. Richards uh, was one of the most important. He took a kind of a discourse-oriented view to metaphor, saw it as both conventional but also uh, ambiguous. And uh, he, of course, was the teacher of Empson, William Empson, who wrote the very important book, Seven Types of Ambiguity, some of you are probably familiar with, and a very, very important work in the, the history of literary criticism, dealing with just this notion of metaphor and the ambiguity that is inherent in it. If we uh, look to some of the linguistic views of metaphor, and I'll spend a little bit more time with these. I'd like to divide those into first the functional track and then into the cognitive track. And the functional linguistic track has produced a number of theories uh, of metaphor. One of the most important was by the Prague School linguist Jan Mukarovsky. And he was a very important figure because uh, he, he did some work I, well, let me read one quotation from him. He says, the function of poetic language consists in the maximum of foregrounding of the utterance. 
It is not used in the services of communication, but in order to place in the foreground the act of expression, the act of speech itself. And through his work, especially with metaphor, he uh, came to develop some important categories such as thinking in terms of marketness theory. Um, basically, he took a semantic kind of view or a sentence-based view of metaphor, he made an important distinction between live and dead metaphors, and also this notion of deviation. You'll sometimes hear the wording about deviation in terms of metaphor uh, theory. And his helpful work on this notion of live and dead metaphors is important because even dead metaphors, you'll hear that referred to, you know, that's a dead metaphor, shows that metaphors are inherently sort of based or built into the language itself. So that even if the metaphors become dead in the sense that we don't respond to it in the same way as we used to, uh, the language itself is predicated upon the, the active use uh, of, of metaphor. Another important figure from uh, linguistics would be Roman Jakobson. And Jakobson, in his work, he actually um, looked at some kinds of language disabilities. And through his uh, talk about some of those, he identified, in his view of metaphor, which was kind of a substitution view, both uh, two axes that are important and we'll talk more about. One is sort of a vertical axis, so you hear me refer to it as a paradigmatic axis, and the other is the horizontal axis, which is more of a syntagmatic axis. And he differentiated between the first one being concerned with metaphor and the second with another figure of speech or trope called metonymy. And that was an important distinction that we will come back to uh, in, dealing, in dealing with metaphor a little bit later. Transformational generative grammar had an early uh, sort of approach to metaphor and really tried to sort of differentiate between non-metaphorical and metaphorical language on the base of, base of the notion of grammaticality and grammaticalness, which was important to that theory, but it wasn't as productive as it might have been. In the area of cognitive linguistics, this is where probably the most work has been done, and probably many of you are familiar with some of the theories of metaphor and, that come out of cognitive linguistics. And uh, one of the most important is conceptual metaphor theory, the work of George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, very, uh, very important work where they found a relatively fixed and finite set of conceptual spheres that were used for uh, metaphor. And so the, the human body is a very important one. And you, you know, so you find that you're at the head of the class, for example, the foot of the bed, things like this, where there's metaphorical equation with the, the parts uh, of the body. And related to the conceptual metaphor theory or is the theory of so-called primary metaphor theory or even conceptual blending theory, where you try to blend together three or more different uh, domains of metaphor so that you could, for example, try to explain how using two metaphors, neither of which is negative, you come up with a statement like the surgeon is a butcher, where it takes on some kind of a negative sense, even though the idea of a surgeon, there's nothing inherently bad about that, or the idea of a butcher, there's nothing inherently bad about that, but you can put them together and suddenly there's a sort of negative sense about it. And that's because you're blending not just metaphor about a surgeon and some task that he performs and seeing it in terms of what a butcher does, but there's some third element that is blended in there of, uh, that brings the negative element. So I've told, uh, I've related these theories very, very quickly, not just because I think it's important for us to situate any kind of a theory that we're talking about within the history of its development, but some other reasons as well. The first is to show the, that there are various strands of discussion in metaphor theory. It's not just the kind of thing we all learn at school that metaphor uses is and, you know, a simile uses like or something like that. It's a little bit more complex than that. Um, and second is that there are a number of fundamental issues that are involved in definitions of metaphor. And these revolve around how they're constructed, uh, their mechanisms, the components of metaphor, you know, how they function, different ways. I mentioned the term tensive, but also substitutional uh, ways that they're done, the idea of deviation, and then really the scope of a metaphor, whether they're concerned with the word, the sentence, the discourse, on what level do they function? And some of these things I'll, I'll come back to. So metaphor in SFL and the New Testament. Systemic functional linguistics is not a cognitive theory of language, although there perhaps are some 
uh, some overlaps, but there are some major differences. And one of them is in the area of metaphor. So other theories have attempted to integrate SFL with other theories of metaphor, but I'm more concerned here with trying to define metaphor in what I'm going to call a modified form of SFL, showing their points, points of similarity as a means of exploring their differences. So there are two types of metaphor that I wish to discuss within this SFL framework. One is lexical metaphor, and the other is grammatical metaphor. And the area of grammatical metaphor um, can be divided into uh, two other kinds that we'll deal with as well, interpersonal and ideational. Now, there have been previous grammars of metaphor or grammatical treatments of metaphor. In fact, many of the theories of metaphor that I surveyed have a grammatical component to them, although sometimes surprisingly less of a grammatical component uh, than you would expect and as I will present. Some of them are based on the idea of the word, some of the sentence, some on the discourse as the sort of the unit uh, that is important to talk about. But in fact, the idea of you know, having something like the syntagmatic and paradigmatic relationship that I mentioned earlier will be a very, very fundamental one to what I'm talking about in terms of metaphor in SFL. So let's turn to lexical metaphor. Lexical metaphor and what lexical metaphor is about. Discussion of metaphor in SFL has concentrated upon the syntagmatic dimension. Remember, that's the syntagmatic, that's the horizontal dimension, to the neglect of the paradigmatic, the paradigmatic or the vertical dimension. And this can be seen in a number of different ways. But I think that's a shortcoming. Uh, it's a shortcoming in a variety of ways because I think that the uh, paradigmatic is in fact very, very important. And I hope to, to make that, that clear. If you want to find a treatment of lexical metaphor, however, within SFL, you won't find very much unless you go to a book by Halliday and Matheson called Construing Experience Through Meaning. Even then, it's an ambivalent treatment of lexical metaphor that actually wants to talk more about grammatical metaphor. Halliday and Matheson differentiate two types of metaphor, examination of an expression from below and examination from above. And those of you who are familiar with SFL will recognize that kind of language. One of them from below is from the lexis. The other from above is from the grammar. Lexical metaphor concerns wording in this scheme. Thus, the word flood has either the literal meaning of an inundation of water or a metaphorical sense of an intense emotion, such as a flood of relief. Examination from above, and this is according to Halliday and Matheson, and I'm interweaving some citations from them here. Examination from above would start with a question of how emotion might be expressed and find either the literal expression, she felt greatly relieved, or the metaphorical expression, she felt a flood of relief. In other words, in some ways, they are the same, differing only in perspective. However, Halliday and Matheson then go on to give two different examples of lexical and grammatical metaphor that are not as readily interchangeable as the above example. They cite the example of lexical metaphor involving the literal applauded loudly, applauded loudly, and the metaphorical applauded thunderously, in which they say that the lexico-semantic domain of volume has been mapped onto the lexico-semantic domain of meteorological commotion. All right? So you can see these lexico-semantic domains are then put upon each other. So you have the difference between the literal, the so-called, and the metaphorical. Grammatical metaphor, by contrast, involves the literal applauded loudly, but the metaphorical loud applause. See the difference there? Applauded loudly, loud applause, in which the grammatico-semantic domain has been mapped onto that of the participants. In other words, what you see is the process of applauding being rendered into an entity an instance of ideational metaphor. So applaud as a verb becomes applause. The difference between lexical and grammatical metaphor, according to Halliday and Matheson, is one of what they call delicacy, not kind, as they are both, quoting, they are both aspects of the same, same general metaphorical strategy by which we expand our semantic resources for construing experience. 
And this idea of delicacy, I think, is an important one, and I'll come back to it. There are a number of problems, however, with this formulation. In their attempt to find congruence between grammatical and lexical metaphor, probably because of the emphasis they want to place on grammatical metaphor instead of lexical metaphor, several terms are used ambiguously. These would include the notion of domain. A lexico-semantic domain is different from a grammatico-semantic domain. Otherwise, we wouldn't actually need the two different terms to describe them. And with it, they have various content and ways in which they are used. The second is the failure to note the fundamental difference between paradigmatic and syntagmatic organization. In effect, the different types of metaphor might be better labeled paradigmatic or lexical metaphor and syntagmatic or grammatical metaphor, as this makes clear both the types of congruence involved and the different elements involved. This also involves the difference between the different ranks, and we'll come back to ranks uh, a little bit later. Lexical metaphor occurs at the word level, and grammatical metaphor at the clause or the sentence level. Making, making such distinctions allows us to understand two further characteristics of lexical metaphor that are noted by Halliday and Matheson. They note that lexical metaphor, though it is paradigmatic in nature, does have the characteristic of being what they call syntagmatic. This means that, lex quoting, lexical metaphors tend to occur in regular clusters, which they call syndromes. Thus, if one were to invoke lexicosomatic metaphors regarding congregation as flock, one might also refer to a religious official as a shepherd and a group of believers as a fold, etc. Second characteristic is that lexical metaphor is paradigmatic. For them, this means, quoting, lexical metaphors typically involve a shift towards the concrete, a move in the direction of what they call objectifying. Now, I believe these formulations involve unfortunate uses of terms, perhaps motivated by the desire to make lexical metaphor into grammatical metaphor. There's nothing syntagmatic about clusters of lexico-semantic metaphors, as each of them constitutes an individual lexical metaphor. I think that it's appropriate to note that they tend to cluster, for sure, but I believe that this is based upon the invocation not simply of a single lexical metaphor, but an entire lexico-semantic domain that includes a variety of lexical items. Further, there's nothing paradigmatic about lexical metaphors tending towards being concrete, except only perhaps if one wishes to make lexical metaphor more like grammatical metaphor, which we're going to discuss in a, in a little bit. In any case, I do not believe that this is in fact necessarily true, or at least true in a particularly helpful linguistic sense. As a result of the second point regarding paradigmatic lexical metaphor, however, Halliday and Matheson note that they do, do not have a general description of lexical metaphorical syndromes or of the location of metaphorical domains within the overall ideation base. So they cite work that has found that, so far as English is concerned, interestingly enough, 87% of the metaphorical entries in a dictionary of metaphor are accounted for by 37 types of motifs, including primarily the human body. They estimate close to a quarter of the metaphors, 23%. Animals, 9%, and it falls down from there. Now, you notice that there's a similarity with the findings of Lakoff and Johnson. Remember, with the conceptual metaphor theory, with the, especially the body providing this uh, metaphorical domain. But I think that Halliday and Matheson have missed the fact that lexical metaphor does not work simply by invoking metaphorical domains, but by the invoking of lexico-semantic domains in non-congruent ways. And there's a difference. There may be tendencies for any number of reasons, but the issue is not metaphorical domains, but domains used metaphorically. Further, I believe that they have not made clear that lexico-semantic domains in SFL are something other than the conceptual domains within cognitive linguistics. Conceptual domains within cognitive linguistics are cognitively organized clusters of information, usually organized around spatial, temporal, and related categories. But that's not the only way to think about these lexico-semantic domains. They can be organized according to a variety of means, including both paradigmatic and syntagmatic features. 
And of course, for those uh, who are aware, we already have a, a tool to help us in this, the Lonidas Semantic Domain Lexicon, not a perfect tool, but one that can be very, very helpful in talking about how domains may be used in relation to each other, and I'll be talking about that in a minute. As examples of use of lexical metaphor, I wish to examine two passages in the New Testament, the conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman in John 4, and the conversation between Jesus and Martha regarding her brother Lazarus in John 11. So I'll begin with John 4. So just to fill you in on the story, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Uh, on his own in Samaria in a town called Sychar, Jesus is tired and he sits by a well. When a Samaritan woman approaches to draw water, Jesus speaks to her and says, give me something to drink. We see that the major semantic domains of the discourse are going to include particular individuals. And so there's a semantic domain, low night at 93, water from a well, natural substances, domain seven, and acquisition of it, physiological processes, domain 23. The woman responds by first pursuing the issue of persons and places, but related to it, and but relating it to Jesus' asking her for a drink. Jesus addresses both of these. He acknowledges that if she had known the gift of God, and that's an instance actually of grammatical metaphor, God giving a gift, and his identity as the one requesting the drink, she would instead have asked him for living water. Now, I think the introduction of living water is a grammatical metaphorization of the notion of water flowing. However, this is a relatively standard grammatico-semantic metaphor of the ancient world as a way of talking about flowing rather than standing water. Some would argue maybe a dead metaphor in that sense. The woman understands this stock metaphor and pursues it. It's found elsewhere, as you know. While Jesus construes the grammatical metaphor so as to pursue the lexico-semantic metaphor on a spiritual level. In that sense, the lexical metaphor is a more delicate form of metaphor because it takes the living water metaphor and creates deeper metaphorical usage. However, the way that the lexical metaphor works here is not according to how we have seen it described above. The metaphor is not moving to a more concrete entity, but to a more abstract entity. Further, the lexical metaphor is not substituting other lexico-semantic domains for living or water, but reconstructing the metaphor by means of a spiritual lexico-semantic domain. The way that it is construed here is in terms of juxtaposing the literal lexico-semantic domain of physical flowing water with a theological lexico-semantic domain of spiritual transformation. There's no specific domain with this semantic designation in the low NIDA lexicon. Perhaps closest would be domain 40 or domain 88. But that is because the low NIDA lexicon mostly is, as it should be, a lexicon of congruent semantic representation, not incongruent metaphorical ones. That would be an endless le lexicon of all the possible incongruent metaphorical uses of domains. The metaphorical uses are created by the reconstrual of a domain by another. In this case, giving theological metaphorical significance to the domain of living water. In that sense, one of the opportunities of lexical metaphor is the reconstrual of any lexico-semantic domain with another on the basis of this reconstrual of meaning. The woman continues the discussion by accepting the metaphor of living water as indicating flowing water and not static water, but she retains the fact that this is a metaphor about qualities of water, nothing more. She queries Jesus' ability to draw such water from the well. However, she does recognize that Jesus has made a claim about himself by his statement about being able to provide such living water. Jesus does not accept this offer to discuss his identity, but he instead pursues the lexico-semantic metaphor of living water as spiritual transformation. His comments are all addressed to this spiritually vital provision. So, unlike the well water, the living water is normally construed. This water that he is speaking of permanently slakes thirst, that is, permanently satisfies spiritual longing, to the point that what it means for this water to be living is that it becomes itself a spring, the same word used as for well, of water welling up to eternal life, another instance of grammatical metaphor. The word for well is the same as spring, and even though Lo Nida placed them actually in separate domains, I think we see that the dialogue is playing, is playing on the use of the same word. The well 
is reconstrued by the lexical semantic domain as a life-giving spiritual source, a spring. The conclusion of the sub-episode, the woman only partly grasps the spiritual transformative significance of the dialogue with Jesus. She has grasped that this is water unlike other water, in that by partaking of it, she will no longer thirst, but she still equates the water with that which is drawn from the well. The second episode occurs in John 11, when Jesus arrives in Bethany and meets Lazarus' sister, Martha. She comes out to meet Jesus, and when she states that if Jesus had been there, Lazarus would not have died, that's a congruent statement, Jesus answers, your brother can expect to rise again, anastasitai. Martha responds by acknowledging, acknowledging that he can expect to rise again, anastasitai, in the resurrection, anastasis, but anastase, in the last day. Jesus says that he himself is the resurrection and the life, Anastasis and Zoe, and that the one who believes in me can expect to live, Zesatai, even if he might die, and everyone who lives and believes in him will not ever die. The conversation is left at that, this point, but Jesus then goes on and raises Lazarus from the dead so that he physically comes from the tomb. What appears at first glance to be a conversation of missed meanings in which the meanings produced by Jesus and Martha are at cross purposes regarding such things as resurrection and life is instead, I believe, a complex set of lexico-semantic metaphorical interactions. In the example in John 4, we observe that both grammatical and lexical metaphors were used. In this instance, we have a similar set of usages. As we'll examine below when we talk about grammatical metaphor, it occurs when the process of rising is transformed into the entity resurrection, but also the entity of life is transformed into the process of living. However, despite the use of grammatico-semantic metaphor, there are instances of congruent and incongruent usage at the metaphorical level. We must bear in mind that Martha and Jesus are both using grammatical metaphor, but there is also lexical metaphorization occurring. Martha understands the congruent construction of a person rising from the dead at the final resurrection, a notion based upon Jewish resurrection thought that had developed in the Second Temple period. We are right in seeing this as in some sense metaphorical usage, but it has become a standard congruent usage also. Jesus, however, shifts the lexico-semantic domain from wordings about a standard view of Jewish eschatology and applies the words metaphorically to himself. The domain is reconstrued from the lexico-semantic domain of Jewish eschatology to another theological lexico-semantic domain related to Jesus' theological belief in himself as the one who is able to resurrect a human being, such as an actual individual resurrection. Martha is speaking about Jewish belief in corporate resurrection at the end of time, and Jesus has metaphorically reconstrued the language of resurrection and life into personal qualities that he believes he himself is able to bestow now. So these are some examples of lexico-semantic metaphor. And I think that they're important because they show that it's in some ways more delicate than grammatical metaphor. It also is based on reconstruing the congruent or literal by means of the metaphorical. And they often work together with the grammatical metaphor. So let's turn now to grammatical metaphor. So the second type of metaphor is grammatical metaphor. And this is the one that SFL has tended to emphasize more fully. So we'll deal first with interpersonal metaphor. Now, there are two major types of interpersonal metaphor in the scheme that Halliday defines. The first is a form of expansion by projection. And uh, this is used to address the issue of mood the way Halliday construes this, let me give you a couple of meta, uh, examples and he, what he does with them. Two different sentences or clauses. Probably that pudding will never be cooked is his first one. The second is, I don't believe that pudding ever will be cooked. Now, he says, Halliday says, that the, what he calls cognitive mental clause, I don't believe in, I don't believe that pudding ever will be cooked, is a metaphorical realization of probability. The probability is realized, and the quoting him here, realized by a mental clause as if it was a figure of sensing. 
Now, uh, you can see what he's saying there because he is reconstruing this in terms of this clausal uh, nexus of bringing these two clauses together. But I actually think that, and, and he goes on to say some equivalent kinds of phrases that are used to represent I believe would be metaphorical in terms of things like it is obvious that, or nobody tries to deny that, or there can be no doubt that, et cetera, et cetera. However, uh, and he has some tests for this with the phrases that one uses uh, to test it. He says that this is a way to sort of upgrade uh, the interpersonal assessment uh, from a group rank to a clause rank. In other words, taking probability as some kind of an adjunct and making it into a full clause, uh, right? I believe or I don't believe, etc. Well, I actually think that um, Halliday is probably wrong, or at least questionable, uh, concerning this dimension of interpersonal metaphor uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, the first is that I think he confuses what he contends is the proposition with something that has some kind of linguistic status apart from the person making the statement and that person's degree of involvement in it. In other words, the congruent interpersonal statement is the statement of belief or thought or feeling made by the speaker of which the projected clause is not the proposition regarding the pudding, for example, but merely the content of the thought. Every statement, I think, is to be understood in this way, whether the projecting clause is present or not. In that sense, whether or not one uses the tag, isn't it, or don't I, which are his tests, the pro projection is of some type of thinking, belief, feeling. Therefore, the alternative constructions that he gives are not the same as I think, but they are, in fact, the metaphorical ways of reconstruing, I think, by metaphorically embedding the speaker within the projection itself, which takes on an enhanced status. Now, does something like this occur in the New Testament? Well, if we look in Romans 7, 7 to 25, I think we can see examples of this kind of interpersonal grammatical metaphor occurring. For example, Paul says that, quote, I do not know sin apart or do no, excuse me, I do not know sin apart from through law, and I did not know desire unless the law said you will not covet. So this is opposed to Paul stating something like sin was no, unknown apart from through law and desire was unknown. Then by means of interpersonal grammatical semantic metaphor, in particular, if you want to label it with more traditional terms, personification, sinning becomes an entity that takes advantage of an opportunity provided by the commandment to accomplish every desire in me, in which Paul is reconstrued as an adjunct of the clause. Sin through the commandment accomplished in me every desire. Paul says, I was alive apart from the law then, but... Here's the metaphor again. The commandment came and sin came to life. I died. And the commandment that was designed for life was found in me to lead to death. So the grammatical semantic metaphor structure continues then until verse 14 when he re returns then to congruent constructions. For we know that the law is spiritual, etc. One of the factors that probably has not been taken fully into account in discussion of this passage in Romans 7 is not the metaphorical personification of sin and death, but the congruent and hence literal grammaticalization of Paul himself throughout much of the passage. And the second type of metaphorical or interpersonal metaphor that Halliday discusses is concerned with so-called speech functions. And some of you will probably be familiar with this. And let me just summarize uh, this instead of going into uh, discussion of it. But it comes from the discrepancy, sometimes called, if you're familiar with speech act theory, with things like indirect speech acts. An indirect speech act would be a statement such as, it is hot in here, right? And if uh, somebody says, it's hot in here, is that meant to be a simple kind of declarative statement regarding the temperature? Or is that some kind of a command regarding uh, adjusting the temperature, turning on the air conditioning, something like, are you really meaning open the window or turn on something, whatever. And Halliday says that this is actually a type of interpersonal metaphor when you have this, uh, this going on. Uh, this kind of metaphor, I think, has some application to Greek, but I think there's some major problems with the formulation of grammatical metaphor in this way. The first is that I'm not convinced that this is, in fact, a type of grammatical metaphor. And the second and far more important issue is the difficulty of determining the speech function when there is incongruity. 
So we're all familiar with discussion of whether certain instances in the New Testament are, for example, commands, reflecting an imperative, or a statement, reflecting an indicative. For example, in Romans 6, is Paul saying, thus indeed you consider, logizistha, yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, or indeed consider, logizistha, yourselves, etc. Or is Paul saying, being free from sin and enslaved to God, you have, ekete, your fruit that leads to holiness, etc. Or being free and enslaved, have, ekete, your fruit. We cannot determine whether the form is an indicative or imperative to say nothing of whether the statement is a Greek command or a statement. Similarly, Romans 12.1, the beseeching formulas that Paul uses. Is Paul there in 12.1? Appearing, Paul appears to be saying what? I encourage, parakalo, you, therefore, brethren, through the compassions of God to establish your bodies as a sacrifice, living, holy, and pleasing to God. The question is whether this indicative formulation is a statement, just simply a statement, right? I am encouraging you, or is it a command? Is Paul encouraging the Romans to take a course of action, or is he issuing a command? I don't think we can tell simply on the basis of the formulation. I think that instead determination of the semantics of the speech function is determined not on the basis of the clausal construal, but on the basis of a variety of factors, including lexical choice, clausal semantics, and discourse semantics of which speech functions, congruent or otherwise, are a part. And I've written an article uh, trying to address this more fully in how you reconcile the speech functions as a semantic thing with the sort of lexical grammar where you do have indicatives and imperatives and how they might uh, relate to each other. And that is an, uh, a thing that, an issue that has not been solved within SFL. It's not been solved within Speech Act theory uh, either. So it continues to be something that is uh, subject to discussion. My, my own solution to it is that you always have to recognize the lexical grammatical configuration and then appeal to a sort of discourse semantics that does not negate what it is in the lexical grammar. So it's going to be an indicative reflecting some kind of a declarative statement, or it's going to be an imperative reflecting some kind of a command, regardless of what it might do at the larger level. Now let's turn to ideational metaphor. Ideational metaphor. This is the second type of grammatical metaphor that uh, is mentioned there, the other being interpersonal. Now we do deal with ideational. Ideational metaphor is more straightforward for the most part, although not entirely. As Halliday states, the general tendency for ideational metaphor is to downgrade the domain of grammatical realization of a semantic sequence, figure, or element from clause nexus to clause, from clause to group or phrase, and even from group or phrase to word. In other words, a process of downgrading, moving down sort of a rank scale. And here's an example that Halliday uses that illustrates the kind of thing he's talking about with ideational metaphor. Quoting him here, this example. Slate was once shale, but over millions of years, tons and tons of rock pressed down on it. The pressure made the shale very hot, and the heat and pressure changed it into slate. So, quoting him at various times here. This example contains two nominalizations, one verbal nominalization, press to pressure, and one adjectival nominalization, hot to heat. These nominalizations are, in fact, examples of ideational metaphors where processes and qualities are construed as if they were entities. Now, there are various types of downgrading that can occur through grammatical semantic metaphor. However, quoting again, nominalizing is the single most powerful resource for creating grammatical metaphor, metaphor. By this device, processes, usually verbs, and properties, such as adjectives, are reworded metaphorically as nouns. Instead of functioning in the clause, they function as something in the nominal group. So the New Testament is full of instructive examples of such ideational metaphor, in which the grammatical semantic potential is expanded by use of the incongruent expression. So a good example is Romans 5, 9 to 11, and its discussion of reconciliation. Paul says this, Much more, therefore, having been justified now in his blood, we shall be saved through him from wrath. For if, being enemies, we were reconciled, kate verb, heiress, passive, indicative, etc., 
to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, katalagentes, an aorist passive participle, we shall be saved in his life. And not only this, but, in, but indeed, boasting in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom now we receive reconciliation, katalagain, a noun, feminine accusative form. In the two instances of the use of the verb forms, each of the verbs serves as the predicator of its own clause. In the first instance, the finite form of the verb is the predicator of a secondary clause as part of the process of a conditional construction. If we were reconciled, then we shall be saved, preceded by a participial adjunct clause. The second instance picks up this conditional process as a participial adjunct of the primary clause of the same conditional, much more having been reconciled in which the participle is the predicator of this secondary embedded clause. The process of reconciling is then grammatico-semantically, metaphorically reconstru reconstrued as the entity reconciliation in the metaphorical statement. The noun reconciliation is used as the complement of the predicator received. So in this example, we see all of the major elements of ideational metaphor. There is the reconstrual of a process into an entity, in this case, reconciling into reconciliation. There's also a downgrading that occurs in which the clausal construction becomes a word group. That is, the verb functioning as a predicator in its own clause is reconstrued as the noun functioning as the head term of a complement in the metaphorical reconfiguration. Major result is that a process becomes an entity through the process of nominalization, and it takes on the characteristics of thingness, whereas it was reconciling, now it's the thingness of reconciliation. The process by which we are reconciled with God becomes the entity of reconciliation itself. Now with this, I could be done describing grammatical metaphor in SFL. However, I believe that there is an element that Halliday has missed, and that is the reverse process from the one that I've just described. I think that at least in Greek, there's a process of grammatical, semantic, metaphorical reconstruel that takes entities and makes them into processes, especially, but not only, when this involves the use of participles as the result. In other words, there's not a necessary downgrading of the domain of grammatical realization, but an expansion of the grammatical semantic potential through reconstruel of entities or attributes as processes. And this is an upgrading. There's several possible preliminary objections to such a consideration. One is that such instances might be seen to involve an unhelpful upgrading, that is an expansion of the grammatical expression, although I don't think that is what necessarily happens, as I hope to show in an example in a moment. Another is that this is perhaps better described as what is usually referred to as grammaticalization and this is a technical term in linguistics regarding this process of changing, lexic uh, changing items into grammatical items and their functions. And in a sense, this is grammaticalization, but it doesn't take on sort of an, uh, an independent grammatical function because it's part of this metaphorical use in a particular instance. Instead, what I think happens here is that this type of ideational metaphor expands the semantic possibilities, especially because of the range of semantic features often associated with verbs within ancient Greek. In this type of grammatical metaphor, we often see entities turned into processes, especially participial verb processes, which expand the semantic function of the entity. So, to illustrate this type of grammatical semantic ideational metaphor, let me use a passage that's very similar to the Romans passage, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20. In this passage, Paul says, quote, all things are from the God who reconciles, katalaxantas, an aorist participle, reconciles us to himself through Christ and who gives us the ministry of reconciliation, katalages. So, so far, this may be seen as an instance of ideational metaphor in which a process is reconstrued as a thing. The process of God reconciling results in a ministry of reconciliation. The process of reconciling becomes the entity reconciliation. In the first construction, the participle is this predicator of a secondary clause that serves defining who God is within this nominal group. In the second, the noun is downgraded to this qualifying element in a nominal group, right? Qualifies the type of ministry. 
However, we also note that there are certain semantic features that are lost in this process of metaphorization. The concord of gender, case, and number provided by the verb is lost, as well as the features of voice and aspect. Paul continues, however, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling, katalason, another participle, the word to himself, not counting their transgressions against them and placing in us the word of reconciliation, katalages. We see a similar process here in this verse as the first one that I mentioned. The first use is congruent with the use of the process of reconciling as part of the predicator. The process is reconstrued as an entity, reconciliation. There is in this verse, as in the previous one, a shift from the more complex structure to the downgraded structure. Here is the main verb of a predicator of a primary clause to a qualifier in a nominal word group, right? Qualifying nature of this reconciliation. It's the word of reconciliation. I would argue again that something is lost in the process of ideational metaphorization. And again, Paul continues, on behalf of Christ, therefore, we are representatives as if God were appealing through us. We implore on behalf of Christ, be reconciled, katalageta. In this climactic discourse structure, Paul ends his reconciliation with language with the imperative form. He does not simply speak of a ministry of reconciliation or a word of reconciliation. Instead, he changes these entities into a process, that of being reconciled. While this does reverse the process of downgrading the structure, we see that this upgraded structure is contained within what is itself a secondary clausal unit. Paul acts as an ambassador. The ambassador implores his audience, and the command to be reconciled is the content of that command. Thus, even though the process is the predicator of a clause, this clause is the projection of a request that is the message of Paul the ambassador. The grammaticalized process expresses mood, Imperative used here in its commanding function. Voice, the passive, used to focus the Corinthians as the grammatical subject, though not the agent of the action. That's implicitly God here. Aspect, perfective, used here of the entire act of reconciliation. Person, second person, directly addressed to the Corinthians. And number, plural, including all of them. The predicator also takes a complement as the recipient of the action. Reconciliation is focused upon God. A final example will help to illustrate the importance of ideational metaphor of this kind of upgrading type that I've uh, mentioned. And the example here is 1 Corinthians 6.12. And in this passage, Paul makes the following statement. All things to me are permitted, existent, but all things are not profitable. All things to me are permitted, existent, but I myself will not be mastered, exousias thesomai. I will not be mastered by anything or anyone. Now, there's much metaphorical wordplay in this verse. This verse has instances of both interpersonal metaphor and ideational metaphor. The first, the interpersonal metaphor, is an expression of the congruent expression, I think that all things are permitted. This is grammatical, semantically, metaphorically reconstrued by embedding the interpersonal feature in the clausal adjunct, to me. It is permitted to me. This construction is used by Paul twice. However, in the second major instance of metaphor, rather than reconstruing the process as an entity, that is, taking existin, it is permitted, it does not become exousia, the noun, the right to act, translate authority, but the process is instead reconstrued as a different type of process, using the cognate ideational verb form based upon the participle of the first verb. So existin, moves through exousia to exousiazo, control someone's rights or master them. So in this instance, we see the reconstrual of the grammatico-semantic domain from one process to a more semantically encoded process. The verb existent has a number of characteristics, including its aspectually and causally vague, impersonal fixed usage, and what is often termed it's often termed a verbal operator or a light verb because of its reduced semantic weight. However, semantic weight is added to the verb through the process of metaphorical reconstruel, in which aspect for aspectual verbs, voice, person, and number, among possibly other semantic features, become part of its grammatico semantic potential. This metaphorization allows Paul to move from the interpersonal metaphor to an ideational metaphor, in which through the future form he specifies 
expectative semantic force. Passive causality with a causal adjunct by anyone or anything, and first person singular with reference to himself. Regardless of whether Paul is citing a Corinthian slogan in this verse, through the process of metaphorical reconstrual of experience, he transforms the interpersonal metaphor into an ideational metaphor that expands significantly not only the semantic potential, but the interpretive significance of the verse. Paul is no longer simply citing an impersonal statement about permissibility, but he is denying any personal mastery of this force of which he speaks. I believe that grammatical metaphor has much more potential than has previously been realized in textual analysis of the Greek New Testament. Only a few preliminary studies have utilized it as it can be used. However, I also believe that definitions of grammatical metaphor may need to undergo thorough scrutiny in relation to the linguistic features of particular languages, in this case, in relation to ancient Greek, in order to maximize their full semantic potential. So, conclusion. I'm far from having said the last word on metaphor, lexical, grammatical, or otherwise. I have not attempted to. What I have attempted to do, however, is to develop metaphor within an SFL framework as a means of understanding some of the features of metaphor as an essential part of linguistic analysis. One of the strengths of some recent theories of metaphor, such as conceptual metaphor theory, is to help us understand that metaphors are fully integrated within our everyday use of language, and that it is difficult to use language without invoking varied semantic domains that expand the communicative capacity of language. I've tried to show that SFL has potential to expand some of the capacities of metaphor theory. Various types of lexical and grammatical metaphor must be taken into consideration as well as a further resource for the creative, communicative function of language. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stan, for a fascinating lecture. We realize one or two you might need to slip away. But we do have uh, a little time for some questions and comments. So who'd like to begin? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so you were talking about when in an ideational metaphor you lose some semantic options when you change like a process into a Thing, or a thing into a process. And those were like you lose your verbal semantic options or your nominal semantic options. Mm -hmm. Do you lose other semantics from like the concept itself? Like if reconciliation is a, turned into a noun or turned into a verb, do you lose other semantic elements? In which type of movement are you talking about? Are you talking about from process to uh, entity or from entity to process? Uh, in either. Neither. Well, I think there's uh, always going to be a little something you gain and something you lose from, from either of them. I'm mostly concerned that in the traditional SFL formulation of, of ideational metaphor, you have process or attribute moving to entity. And the idea, I think, is that um, keeping in mind that SFL formulated primarily in, in terms of English, and English is the basis of the theory. And so you have uh, a relatively, in some ways, underdeveloped notion of, of the verb. And you have probably um, nothing sig really significantly lost by means of that when you move to, to an entity, right? And so you gain the idea of the thingness, right? It becomes, in some way, sort of concrete. Uh, you have this downgrading that, that Halliday talks about. Uh, but in Greek, we know that with the verbal system the way it is, there's so much encoded information in the verbal structure, you know, especially in something like a participle, right? And so you have elements of the nominal and of the verbal capacity, right? And so you have you know, the, you know, the case and all of that on the nominal side and the verbal with aspect and voice. Uh, you lose pretty much all of that, or a good chunk of that, to come up with your entity. And so as I've seen, uh, looked at that, what I'm concerned to do is to not simply say that uh, when we deal with Greek, we're going to deal with Greek in terms of simply 
um, it being a form of English, right? In the understanding it through the same categories that were used for English. And Halliday himself uh, subscribes to the Sapir Whorf hypothesis, some of you will know of. And so for those of you who don't, the Sapir Whorf hypothesis is a theory of linguistic determinism that says that the way we uh, construe reality is to a large extent um, based on the resources of the language that we use. And so there's a relationship between the language we use and how we think about things and how we express things in our language. And so it seems to me that if we're going to be doing uh, analysis of Greek, we need to actually rethink the categories in terms of what goes on in Greek. And so when I look at the system uh, in Greek, I see that some things are lost. But if we take an entity and we then can reconstrue that as a process, especially with a participle, we gain information. And so you may, and you don't even necessarily lose thingness uh, because it is a participle. A participle could have thingness as well as, you know, processness or whatever you want to call it. So it gains an awful lot with that. So that's kind of what motivated me to uh, try to reverse this thing around. And then when I started looking at it, several passages seem to be playing on this alternation then between the participle and the noun and the noun to or a verb or something like that. And so that, that's what pushed me to explore that. Does, that. does that give you some idea of my thinking about it? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, Stan. Um, most people who read the Bible will have no capacity to undertake the kind of analysis you've just conducted. I wonder how much that would compromise their capacity to understand the text. Well, it's a good question. I think it's the same question we ask all the time when we uh, look at anything in biblical scholarship. Most of the reason that we do biblical scholarship is because we think that more can be gained uh, by a detailed examination than is readily apparent simply by um, claiming to read the text, especially in some sort of a, a straight, you know, sort of this idea, the, the plain sense that emerges from the text. And so in that sense, I don't think it's any different from any other biblical interpretation that goes on. And that is that we believe that through doing particular kinds of, of work, we can gain understanding. Uh, what I would like to see is that the kinds of things that I'm talking about here would become more pervasive, especially in the kinds of critical works uh, that are used in explicating uh, the text. Um, and not necessarily that every reader of the Bible is going to be expert in some kind of linguistic theory or expert in theories of metaphor, but that in perhaps some of the things that they will use when they approach reading the Bible will have been significantly influenced by them so that it would make an impact on what they're, they're doing. So for example, uh, if we're talking about some of these reconciliation passages, you could see where perhaps something to do with that could talk about how uh, Paul is shifting from verbs to nouns or nouns to verbs, however you would like to characterize those, and say something about then uh, what we can understand more fully about what m might be motivating or going on, motivating Paul and going on when we understand those within the text. And that could be something that would help uh, a reader of the Bible. Our translations could themselves perhaps help to capture some of that, even in the way they approach uh, approach the translation task. There was one uh, passage in here where um, the, one of the translations I was dealing with takes uh, some of the language and changes it around in a way so that some of the play on the language that I'm trying to talk about in the metaphor is obscured, if not lost. Here would have been a case where perhaps keeping some of the phrasing separate uh, and more clearly articulated in terms of what I see at least is going on would have helped a reader who even didn't know the theory behind it to understand something about what is being done in the language, right? So those would be the kinds of things. So maybe not a direct access, everybody has to be a theoretician of metaphor, but certainly the kind of intermediate steps that influence how readers read could be better informed that way. So perhaps just as I pass it over to, if Paul had only talked about reconciliation and had never used the verb to be reconciled, 
what would we have lost theologically in our understanding of what Paul was saying? Well, I think we probably would have lost a number of different things. Uh, it depends on what you mean by what we have lost theologically. It uh, probably depends on, on what you're going to, semantic freight you're going to unload on the noun. But if you look at that verb, it's interesting you should ask that, and there's no doubt part of the reason that I um, chose those examples is I, I wrote a whole book on the verb on katalasso that's used for reconciliation. So, uh, and it's the verb form that actually probably is the most significant in the use of the language. And uh, it itself is a verb that's about uh, transactional in nature. And it deals especially coming out of language of, of uh, exchanging one thing for another. And so it then comes to be used in contexts where you not only exchange physical items, but you can end up exchanging non-physical items. And so you can exchange enmity for peace, for example. And so it becomes this very highly relational uh, language and uh, was used especially if there were warring parties, cities, or whatever, and they would need to be reconciled to each other through you know, choosing to so-called you know, uh, bury the hatchet, you know, do away with their hostility in order to establish peace. And so if we didn't have uh, that understanding of the verb, then we probably would miss out on a lot of the significance of what uh, that particular verb uh, conveys. Not that we couldn't get it in some ways through the noun, but the noun doesn't seem to have the same kind of, of usage or history uh, as, as the verb does. Well, thank you very much. I was wondering if you could, if, if I could just bring you to take SFL into more focused discussion of metaphor in the sense that a lot of metaphor theorists talk about the importance of defining metaphor and all of the debates that surround that, but it has something to do with defining or speaking of one thing in terms of another or thinking about one thing in terms of another. So X is like Y, even though there's a lot of metaphors that don't fit that pattern. But the labels that we can give to those pieces are tenor and vehicle, focus and frame, source and target, and these types of things, which seems to be really useful for speaking about lexical metaphors according to the rubric that you've laid out. But I have trouble seeing how grammatical metaphors, how you can identify a source and target in a grammatical metaphor. So when we're talking about reconciliation, that doesn't seem to me to be speaking about one thing in terms of another. And the switch between nouns and verbs seem to be doing something different than the type of thing that's being done by a lexical metaphor. So I'm just wondering how appropriate it is to talk about the specific phenomenon that you're isolating here with the term grammatical metaphor, with what we actually normally mean when we talk about metaphor. Does that, does that make sense? Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good question. Uh, I think part of the, the issue is um, the, the definition of what we normally think of as metaphor. And I think that's part of the problem, is that we've probably been, uh, in some ways, lax in thinking that metaphor is one particular kind of thing. In this equative sense, you know, and it goes back to the, to the ancient Greeks. Uh, they have this sort of this is that view of metaphor, right? And so from early on, it's a substitutionary kind of view where you substitute one thing for another. And then if, as long as they kind of fit together, that's kind of okay. But then what if they don't really fit together? And then you have views of tensive metaphor that grow up from that because now there's tension between the two. Uh, that's a very narrow and constrained view of metaphor. And what I think uh, we're trying to do in thinking about metaphor in SFL is expand the categories of what we mean by metaphor, and in fact, expand it in ways that show that metaphor is much more readily present and used and fundamental to what we do in our language just by the use of the language uh, rather than trying to identify you know, the, the tenor or the vehicle or whatever, uh, whatever it is, which is in the standard view. The lexical view of metaphor has many of those same characteristics. One of the differences would be that it's more uh, concerned with trying to identify this notion of a lexico-semantic domain rather than simply individual items or entities that are played off against each other. And so I think even there in, lexical, in the lexical metaphor, SFL has tried to move beyond. If you look at some of the work in cognitive metaphor, there's a, 
uh, a tendency to identify these metaphorical spheres as if the spheres themselves have metaphorical significance. And I think that SFL uh, has made clear that any sort of lexicosemantic domain can be uh, functioning within lexical metaphor and that the domains themselves are not necessarily uh, metaphorical. It's just in the reconstrual of things that they become metaphorical. So I think that's actually an advance or something more helpful. But the innovative part is clearly going to be the um, dealing with the grammatical metaphor because it does move outside of that rather narrow definition and tries to capture, I think, in a more explicit and rigorous way what some earlier theorists were trying to talk about when they tried to talk about even the, the formulation of is is used for metaphor and like with simile. There's something grammatical that is being talked about there in a very sort of imprecise way. But the, the um, grammatical metaphor tries to nail that down in two particular ways. And the two major ways is that, as, if, as some of you will know, SFL tries to talk in terms of three sort of major functional ways of language acting, and that's in terms of the textual, the interpersonal, and the ideational, right? The ideational being the, the whatness, you know, what are things about interpersonal being sort of the relational, and then textual, how the thing is construed as a text. And there's not so much done with the textual metaphor, although I think in some ways the lexical metaphor actually can be seen as properly being more textual. Uh, if you understand the notion of text as being how these uh, items are cohesive together, something like that. But the grammatical metaphor is the innovation. And to show that now we can talk in terms of how grammar is used in a way that basically says not just is something else, but is reconstrued as something else. And that's where you get the similarity to the uh, this is that idea or the two domains. It's reconstrued as something else. And so it is a process that is reseen as an entity. And I'm saying now it's an entity that is reseen, reconstrued as a process. Uh, or in terms of the speech functions, right? It's a, an imperative, but it's really being, you know, or let's say an easier one is a statement or a declarative statement. It's really being reconstrued as a command. Right? And so these are all reconstruals that are bringing the two, whatever those things are, into equation with each other. But it's not necessarily just one lexeme with another or one idea with another. It's a whole way that it's grammatically formulated with the other. OK, does that make uh, sense? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Well, time slipped away. Language is one of those things that we all use all the time but how much more insight we can get when we study language. And uh, Stan has done that for many years. Let's thank him tonight for all the insight he's brought us. Do join me.